Qu'est-ce que c'est que cette plaisanterie Hey, you're probably wondering what exactly is going on here. Who are these people? Why is the turkey made of plastic? Why does this room look so uncanny? Where's that knocking coming from? Why does it all feel so... weird? This is a scene from a film called The Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie, directed by Spanish-Mexican filmmaker Luis Buñuel and released in the year 1972. I highly recommend you watch it, it's my second favorite film of all time and it's considered one of the best surrealist films of all time. Whether you have seen it already or not, the rest of the scene will probably also confuse you. This sequence seems off. It's a striking image, for sure, but both the people who have seen the rest of the movie and the people who have not have no clue why this happens or what exactly it means. To explain the discreet charm of the bourgeoisie's premise in the most abstract and simple fashion, it's a story about six rich people who decide to have dinner together but are constantly prevented from eating by absurd circumstances. But we'll get into more of that later. First, I'd like to talk about the film's director for a second, because knowing his background and how his work evolved over time is crucial to quote-unquote get this film. Director Luis Buñuel was active from the years 1929 all the way up to 1977, and his filmography has an eclectic amount of stunning material within it. Although he had obvious transitional phases in between, there were primarily three distinctly different periods in Buñuel's career, starting off in the late 1920s. 20s and early 30s when he went to Spain to collaborate with prolific and famously infamous painter Salvador Dali to create two films, one of them titled Un Chan Andalou from 1929 and another one called L'Age d'Or from 1930. When hearing the name of Salvador Dali, most people's minds immediately think of his iconic painting The Persistence of Memory, which became such a phenomenon in the modern art world because of the surreal imagery depicting melting clocks. The two collaborative projects between Buñuel and Dali follow the same idea, and that is trying to portray something that is free, nonsensical, illogical and perplexing, something so inscrutable that there'd be no way to interpret or analyze their work in a rational or literal or even metaphorical way. The two works received an uproarious reaction at the time, and it's really not all that surprising when factoring in its unbelievably scandalous and partially disturbing visuals throughout both of the these films, the most important one being this scene that features a woman's eye being slit by a knife. Another outrageous thing about their work were the clear criticisms of Christianity, especially in L'Age d'Or, which would lead to the film's national ban in France. These two films are nowadays seen as the birth of cinematic surrealism and influence pretty much any filmmaker you can think of when you hear the word surrealism. After removing himself from collaborator Dali, Buñuel directed close to no films for a period that lasted more than 10 years. When he finally decided to continue pursuing cinema, he went to Mexico and began the phase of his career which is simultaneously considered the least important in historical context, but also the most important in his own development process. Process. Here in Mexico, Buñuel would create more than a dozen films which were drastically different from his first two ventures in the world of cinema, because he was avid to make very grounded and rational melodramas about the socio-political problems of Mexico at the time, like Grand Casino, El or the famous Los Olvidados. These were not manifestations of insanity quite like Unchan Andalu, but rather surprisingly honest, real and human stories that he tried to tell. This is the part of his career where he truly learned how to craft a compelling drama, and could improve his own direction with the fundamentals of tension, storytelling and dramaturgy, which leads us right to Buñuel's final period, which many would say starts in 1960 when he returned to Spain to make a quite polarizing film titled Viridiana. While this film isn't 
quite the best representation for Buñuel's late work in a stylistic sense, it is the most artful and unconventional thing that he had made in nearly 30 years. It was beloved by critics at the time and even won the Palme d'Or at the Cannes Film Festival. But there was a problem. You see, it's hard to properly explain everything that Viridiana was about. Because it is an incredibly morally complex art house drama, but let's just say it was not only shocking for its time, but also quite critical of the Francoist dictatorship in Spain at the time. Which is why the film was even banned after it received its win at Cannes. Buñuel throughout his career was always heavily against censorship, which is why this was such an unfortunate case for him. Et alors d'autre part, êtes-vous pour ou contre la censure je suis complètement contre la censure, complètement. Sans discussion et sans limitation. Alors tous les films pour tous les publics et pas de censure. C'est ça. An artist returning to his home to create a film that was finally a little bit different and more ambitious only to be banned. That's a rather disappointing experience for everybody. Thankfully, this didn't dishearten Buñuel from continuing and he never looked back. He did not want to do what he made in his early career, nor did he want to limit his potential by doing melodramas. He wanted to create something far more interesting and meaningful than his previous movies. But how could that be done? especially when you can get banned for criticizing. Well, with his next film, Buñuel immediately found the formula to make something that could criticize political and social conditions without ever offending anybody. In 1962, The Exterminating Angel was released, and that is truly the birth of the Buñuel that I'm here to talk about today. Buñuel took advantage of the skills that he acquired while making the surrealist films with Dali and the skills he acquired while making melodramas in Mexico to create a film that was both surrealist yet a functional drama at the same time. The story is about a group of rich people who find themselves being trapped because they mysteriously cannot leave the room. A setup like that brings the surrealism to the world of his film, yet is also a perfect frame and setting to create dramatic tension between the characters. Through very abstract forms and scenarios, he subtly criticizes religion and the bourgeoisie and the people at the time barely even noticed if they didn't know it was Buñuel who made the film. This method of creating a satire by using a foundation of actual characters in drama, but putting them in a fundamentally surreal but not totally impossible scenario, leads to something that we could call soft surrealism, and exactly that is the essence of every film that Buñuel would go on to make afterwards until his death in 1983. One of the handful of masterpieces that he would make in the later stage of his career is the aforementioned The Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie, and I would like to take a look at the cinematic juxtapositions that he creates within that film between the world of the real and the surreal. The Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie has a lot of imagery that you wouldn't necessarily call unreal realistic, however they do seem kind of odd. These juxtapositions and images include, for example, a gun in beautiful porcelain pottery, a sniper rifle in a pretty cabinet, the bourgeoisie hastily strolling down a country road, a Christian bishop using a shotgun, a rich married couple in the dirt for sex even though their mansion is right next to them, a dead person in a restaurant, or even cockroaches on a piano. These are all images that aren't impossible to happen, but rather unlikely and something that wouldn't happen often if at all. But there are also juxtapositions within the rather contrasting scenarios being displayed by Buñuel. A bishop becoming a gardener for example, or a rich man randomly shooting out of the window to the streets of Paris. A military garrison interrupting the upper class during their dinner, and later on even battle sounds while they're trying to eat. An ambassador of a state flirting with a terrorist to try to kill him, or quote unquote fine, rich men secretly dealing drugs. There is a sort of anarchy within these juxtaposed concepts, yet Buñuel's surrealism is light and his criticisms are softly displayed and very easy to miss for the white masses. The framework created by the repetitious experience is fundamentally an interesting idea and it's no wonder it has been used as a premise for storytelling in multiple art forms and mediums over time. But Buñuel also uses it as a tool for criticism while still maintaining the focus on entertainment. Une fois de plus, 
ils ne peuvent pas manger. Alors, c'est une scène qui paraît extrême que dans un restaurant, mais qui, plus tard, s'est réalisée, en réalité. C'est-à-dire que dans un célèbre restaurant français, quand le patron est mort, on l'a mis dans la salle de son restaurant et on a réalisé un repas autour de lui. Par des gens qui, certainement, n'ont pas fait ça en l'honneur du charme discret de la bourgeoisie, en l'honneur du film. Donc, c'est, vous voyez, c'est, c'est à la limite du point de rupture, mais encore acceptable et puis surprenant, drôle et permettant à Louis et à moi d'avoir un catalogue de, de la cuisine française par le simple énoncé des plats qu'ils ne mangeront pas. The biggest pain of this sex set of characters is not being able to have a lavish dinner and constantly being interrupted because of rather absurd circumstances. This is their biggest problem, but in the end, the character wakes up, all of it was just a dream, within a dream, within a dream, and now he can finally eat in safety. A brilliant way to showcase the bourgeoisie and how they only face issues in dreams at worst and not in real life at all while presenting it as a joke. To not be overly obvious with their critiques, Buñuel and co-writer Carrière try to write sequences which aren't too outrageously surrealist or scandalous. Because of that approach to writing, it is a surrealist film that could, in technicality, be true, which is why many criticisms could fly over one's head if you initially take it as just a tool for humor instead of seeing the meaning behind it. The rest is uh, the rest is the story of his success. Won the, the the Oscar of the best foreign film. You know, he went all over the world. You know, and uh, until today, maybe it's one of the best known of uh, Buñuel's uh, uh, films. And I like it very much. You know, I, I remember my friends in Paris, and they were so happy with the film. You know, that finally a film which doesn't say anything. <laughs> And, but you are interested from beginning to end. You, you laugh, you know, you want to know what's going on, and nothing is going on. <laughs> it is surprising, a little bizarre, but never over the top or overly obvious when showing something symbolic, which was exactly their goal when writing the screenplay for it. Subtlety is exactly the key to why this film is such a joy to watch, but also something that you can revisit again and again to decipher more meaning, and Carrière and Buñuel understood that. Oui, on a fait cinq versions différentes du scénario à partir de là, parce que alors, les questions commencent à se poser. Euh, un coup, les gens se réunissent pour manger dans un endroit X. On entend du bruit au plafond, très très lourd. Le plafond s'effondre et un hippopotame tombe dans la salle à manger. Naturellement, ça interrompt le repas. Mais est-ce qu'on peut aller jusque-là Est-ce que ça ne fait pas partie justement des éléments inacceptables, extravagants, invraisemblables oui. Donc, Le problème va être maintenant de trouver ce chemin toujours très très étroit entre le surprenant et l'impossible. C'est-à-dire quel chemin suivre qui puisse être acceptable, qui ne soit pas du cinéma fantastique ou surnaturel, mais qui soit quand même très surprenant. There are many other examples of the rich facing nothing more than just minor inconveniences but making it their biggest concern, such as when Monsieur and Madame Sénéchal's biggest conflict is not getting the chance to have sex because their friends are over for dinner, or Madame Tevino not getting the chance to sleep with Don Raphael because her husband knocks on the door, or when the group is being humiliated in front of a crowd, like in that scene I showed in the beginning of the video. Hell, even the women not getting the right beverages in a restaurant is an example for this idea. The bourgeoisie's privileged life is something that they've grown accustomed to, which is why little problems like these get some serious reactions out of them. In contrast to that, Buñuel later also shows the issues of real and much less fortunate people to make his point on class differences much clearer, like the working waiters grieving over the dead man in the restaurant, or the entire subplot involving trauma featuring the ghost of a dead mother and a young boy murdering his fraudulent father. Another example being the soldier's dream about an old friend who's been dead for years or a dying old man asking for forgiveness after committing an awful crime, as well as the ghost of an officer haunting the police station and repenting his wrongdoings because of his guilty conscience. Obviously, suffering is something relative to every individual, but creating that juxtaposition between the rich and the poor in this way leaves no room for interpretation as to whose side Buñuel was on when he directed the film. 
Although he grew up in a privileged background, a lot of his art was about the exact opposite. Especially during his period in Mexico, Buñuel made films that were about ordinary people, to whose social conditions Buñuel always had a curiosity for. Which is exactly why films like Los Olvidados still garnered such a following even though it lacks his trademark surrealism. Since he spent a majority of his career in Mexico, many elements of his critical stances in the discreet charm are even attached to Latin America. When we take a closer look on Fernando Rey's character, who is not only a drug dealing ruler of a fictitious republic called Miranda, but also one who continuously denies any speculative allegations or negative judgement towards the state throughout the film, it is clear that it's a way to represent the not so uncommon corruption and exploitative governments that are plaguing the poor South America. To also mirror how helpless these states really were at the time is shown by Don Rafael, who, when meeting an activist, only mocks said activist or even tries to go as far as to violently silence them. Don Rafael is the most interesting character, because he represents quite a lot and his dreams or at least his misfortunes within this long and collective dream sequence are by far the most actively difficult and harmful. Like having to shoot somebody or even towards the end during the final minutes of the film where he decides to pursue his gluttony. During the last part of the film, a group of men enter the house and after a little bit of banter and arguing they shoot all five of the bourgeoisie. But wait, they were a sextant, not a quintet. Raphael is under the table hiding from the perpetrators, though even while he is in safety down there, he pathetically decides to take the risk and foolishly attempts to get himself a piece of meat from the table, which leads to him eventually getting caught by the men. Oh yeah. The reasons why his parts of the dreams are a lot more extreme than the ones of his friends is because he is the ruler of a probably poor little state in South America, which most likely has a large crime and corruption rate. And of course, if you're an ambassador of a place like that, you're exposed to serious or even violent issues like that a lot more than the average wealthy man. This gets represented in smaller capacity earlier in the film when we see the aforementioned rifle in his office or the revolver in his porcelain pottery. The other five main characters mostly concern themselves with being prevented from having intercourse, some of it extramarital, and not getting the food they want. But with Don Rafael's character, Buñuel created a bridge between the bourgeoisie and the poor by having someone who faces these issues often because of his work. However, Buñuel still decides to make a distinction between him and the ordinary citizen, because while he may be aware of the working class's social issues, he still gets to wake up from this nightmare and gets himself a little bit of food from his fridge as a cause of him being in a position of power. There are various other depictions of these very privileged people coming in contact with forms of suffering because they have faced injustice before, such as the bishop, who ironically decides to become a gardener only to later in the film realize that his parents were murdered by their gardener when he was still a child. Another one of these bridges between the rich and the poor are the leading three women. Buñuel sees the women in this film as some form of force to possibly break out of the ridiculous norms of the bourgeoisie when compared to their male counterparts, such as the scene with the dead body in the restaurant where the women are the first to take initiative and see exactly what is up with the soaring cries from the next room, whereas one of the men there says they should not be indiscreet trying to prevent the women from even just acknowledging the suffering of somebody that is below them. <laughs> This gets incorporated later on and plays a larger role in the film too, such as when the female activist is one of the few people actually trying to do something against the injustices in Miranda, but then gets caught by Don Rafael only to be belittled in her actions and even sexually harassed by him. The women in Buñuel's films suffer a lot, which quite a few people actually interpret as some form of manifested misogyny, but I would argue it's the complete opposite. Films like Diary of a Chambermaid or Viridiana prove that the man could possibly even be considered a feminist, just not one in the traditional form. 
He's kind of similar to David Lynch in that way, not just because he's a surrealist, but because he depicts the suffering of female characters while still thematically fighting for them, but I digress. What I'm trying to say is that Buñuel was not only one of the all-time greatest filmmakers, but also a moralist who actively fought for the people who were less privileged than him with his art that would speak to them and make people aware of issues. What makes his work so masterful is the unbelievable subtlety within his satire that would challenge its audience but have continuous levity throughout it. It's hard to feel offended while watching it if you are a person from one of the groups he criticizes in The Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie because he doesn't spoon feed you with what is wrong about the upper class and instead presents ridiculous scenarios and juxtapositions to let you figure out the obvious hypocrisy and injustice for yourself. It took him over 40 years to master this nearly impossible task of creating a satire that would be inoffensive while still packing such a punch and hiding so much meaning under its surface. And it worked. The film never had any controversy around its satirical elements, and it was a huge financial success. It even won an Academy Award, which is natural irony at its absolute finest. The discreet charm of the bourgeoisie. Right. Not that the film wouldn't deserve such praise and acclaim, it's one of the most perfect films of all time in my opinion. And there is no satire that balances each element of its substance as flawlessly as Buñuel does here, but it is hysterically funny to see them cluelessly awarding a film that so nonchalantly makes fun of the life that the rich elite in Hollywood lives. Buñuel himself once said, quote, Nothing would disgust me more, morally, than to receive an Oscar. But hey, to those who truly understand Buñuel's genius, it's one of the greatest pieces of modern art. To those who have no clue about the film's meaning, well, maybe they'll find out someday.